Unless you live under a rock, I doubt that there's anybody who isn't aware of the uh, events that have happened this last week when Russia, which has been massing around Ukraine, finally decided to go in and to try to take Ukraine under the uh, excuse that um, it was theirs anyway. In my heart, I feel very sorry for those people. I know that there was a lot of corrupt people in leadership in Ukraine, um, but for the average person, there's many of those young people who have never known what it was like under the Soviet regime when it fell in 1991. They've known nothing different than what they've known since then, the younger people that are there. And, and I can't help but feel a little bit like this whole situation feels like the bully, uh, that Russia is the bully on the playground, beating up the little kid while everybody else stands around and says, you shouldn't do that, but nobody steps in to do anything to help. Uh, and, and I understand that there's a lot of things that are involved here, that um, if the United States or any of these NATO countries would step in, that it probably would usher in World War III. But it, it doesn't stop from creating kind of this feeling of helplessness as you watch uh, an evil man who goes after, pursues his own agenda at the expense of helpless people. In some of the reports that I've seen, of course, we saw on the television where the United States and Germany and, and Britain and many other countries have sanctioned Russia and have uh, said, you know, that we're going to not allow these purchases to take place, uh, limited some of the banking that, they're, that Russia and some of the individuals are able to do. And yet, even in spite of that, China has kind of run an end round about that by um, buying millions and millions of barrels from, of oil from Russia and uh, tons and tons of wheat as well, kind of making the sanctions that the rest of the world is trying to do less effective by providing a, a path for them to you know, export their goods in spite of the things that the rest of the world is trying to do. Um, I can't help but also be a little bit concerned that as the world is focused on what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, that China uh, won't you know, take advantage of that to move on Taiwan that they have wanted for a long time as well. And as all of these things have happened, the talks, the nuclear talks between Iran have kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, and it's easy to look at the things that are going on around us and be really, really concerned. But I just want to remind you that the Bible does say that in the end, at the very end of world history, that things will get worse. I'm not saying that we're there. I'm saying that the Bible says that at the end, things are going to get worse. It talks about a one world government, a one world economy, a one world monetary system. People are not going to willingly give up their freedoms that they have unless they perceive that there's something to gain in return. But what I want to focus on is that rather than focus on the things that we cannot change. Now, we, we should be praying. Don't misunderstand me. One of the things that we can do is we can pray. And we should be doing that. Absolutely, we should be doing that. But instead of just wringing our hands and focusing on things that we can't change, one of the things that we can change is where we stand with our maker, where we stand with Jesus. And so this morning, um, I've entitled the message, Guard Your Heart. In Proverbs 4.23, it says this, Above all else... Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring 
of life. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 16 through 20, it says this, Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Now, in this particular passage, the religious leaders have rebuked Jesus because the disciples have been eating with unceremonial unceremonially washed hands okay and they're saying well it's going to make them unclean and Jesus responds and says it's not the food that you take that makes you unclean it is the things that come from your heart that make you unclean did you notice there he said for out of the heart come evil thoughts murder adultery sexual immorality theft, false testimony, and slander. He said to those religious leaders, what you really should be concerned about is not how clean their hands are, but how clean their hearts are. Solomon said that above all else, we need to guard our heart. This morning, there are three things that I think that we can do in order to help guard our heart. And the first is this, is to be careful what you surround yourself with. Be careful what you surround yourself with. In 1 Corinthians 15.33, it says this, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I know that I've used this illustration before, but when I was growing up, you know, we didn't have Cartoon Network. We didn't have, you know, 24-hour cartoon stations. If you wanted to watch cartoons, you had to get up on Saturday morning. And uh, Saturday morning was also the day that mom and dad got to sleep in. And we lived in an old parsonage. And so the stairs creaked. And it was almost impossible. In fact, I don't know if I ever made it down the stairs without mom telling me to go back to bed. Because, you, you know, you tried to step like at the very edge where the board is coming up so that it didn't make noise. But inevitably, the old house would creak and mom would hear it and she'd say, back to bed. Right? But if you made it down... <clears throat> down to the base or down to the first floor to the TV you got to watch Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner and and those cartoons and in between the cartoons were the infomercials right uh conjunction junction what's your function any guys remember that or a few of you are old enough to remember that okay and the other one that I really really remember is you are what you eat from your head down to your feet right um you know That may or may not be true, but you do become what you associate yourself with. What you surround yourself with becomes what's important to you. So if you surround yourself with good things, good things are going to happen. If you surround yourself with bad things, bad things are going to happen. And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 15 says. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And this, I think, applies to both people and to things. It applies to both people and to things. If you surround yourself with bad people, it's going to be a constant drag on you. Now, I'm not saying that we all need to live in a monastery, right? Because we can't impact our world if we do. We can't just separate ourselves from the world Otherwise, we won't be able to be that light that Jesus calls us to be in Matthew chapter 5, where he says, uh, let your light shine in such a way that others will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 
But if we constantly surround ourselves with those people, they will drag us down. I think that's part of the reason that it's so important that we come together to worship on Sunday because it recharges our spiritual batteries. It encourages us. There is accountability when we come into God's house and we come in contact with his scripture, his word. And it encourages us and makes us ready to go out for another week. It's important. Hebrews 12 says, don't forsake the assembling as some are in the habit of doing. But if we constantly surround ourselves with sinful people, it's going to drag us down. When um, I was growing up in school, we had one amazing summer for youth group. And we were the closest that we had ever been. And then when I started school, I took a work experience class. So that's basically where I left school and I went to this shop and um, I got to do all the grungy, yucky stuff like clean out the parts washer and stuff like that. Um, But it was designed to give me an idea of what that line of work would be like. The only problem was is that the owner there, he, he cussed like a sailor. And when I first went there, every time he would swear, it was just like fingernails on a chalkboard. But what really concerned me is that the longer I was there, the less that the swearing bothered me. Because I was becoming acclimated to it. I was becoming accustomed to it. And it's the same principle that we see here. You know, kind of like boiling the frog. You put the frog in a hot pan of water and he'll jump out. But if you gradually warm that water up, he'll die because he never knows when it's too hot and jumps out. So it applies to people, but it also applies to things as well. You know, there are things that, that we know will get us into trouble. Melanie, this morning, had me bring over the cake that she made for the carrion dinner. Man, that thing smelled great. <laughs> right? Okay, and if she left that, you know, and was gone, instead of just making it this morning, that would have been a huge temptation for me. There are things that we know cause us to stumble. And we need to make sure that we don't have those things around us. So if, if pornography is a strong struggle, then maybe what we need is a net nanny. You know, a program that will help keep us from going places that we know are going to lead us into trouble. If, if I have a problem with gambling, then I shouldn't be going to Meskwaki, right? If I have a problem with becoming drunk, then I need to make sure that I'm not in places that I'm going to be tempted to drink. It only makes sense. And sometimes we allow things that in and of themselves are not wrong to become idols because we make them more important than Jesus to us. It's one thing to say there's nothing more important to me than Jesus, that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. But sometimes if other people were looking at our lives, would they say the same thing? When I was in college, my cousin Jeff, my very first ministry, full-time ministry was down in Puxico, and and Jeff uh, did his internship at a little church in Dexter, Bernie, Bernie, Missouri, down by Dexter. And um, Jeff had, at the time, uh, today it wouldn't be considered much, but it was a Nintendo entertainment system. And he had this game that by today's standards would be pretty lame. But 
back in that day, it was called Baseball Stars, right? And the really cool thing about it was that you could build up your player, something that's like really common today, but was brand new kind of back then. And so you could get a better baseball team by trading your players and getting better players and, and doing different stuff. Jeff reached a point where he realized that the gaming system was keeping him from doing stuff that he knew he should be doing. And so he, he got rid of it. He saw it quite literally as a sacrifice that he was making to God because he burnt it. <laughs> he destroyed it. Be, and, and it was his way of saying to God, I'm placing you first. I'm choosing you over my entertainment system. Now, did he have to burn it? Probably not. But for him, it was important. Because it was his way of saying, I'm choosing God over my, over my Nintendo. Are there things in our life that we maybe don't need to burn, but we need to find a new home for? Because they're in danger of displacing Jesus from the throne of our life. As I look at the world around me, there's a lot of things that I can't change. I can pray for what's going on in Europe, but I can't physically change the heart of Vladimir Putin. I can't change the orders that have been given to those soldiers. But what I can do is I can make sure that my life is right with my maker so that regardless of whatever happens, I'm ready. If the Lord calls me today, I'm ready. If the Lord calls me 20 years from today, I'm still ready. The second thing that I think is important is that we need to be careful what we admire. We need to be careful what we admire. Matthew 6, 19-21 says, Do not store up treasures here on earth where they can be eaten by moths and get rusty and where thieves break in and steal. But store your treasures in heaven where they will never become moth-eaten or rusty and where they will be safe from thieves. For wherever your treasure is, there your thoughts and your heart will also be. Now, the part that I want to focus the most on here is that very last part, verse 21, where it says, wherever your treasure is, there your heart and your thoughts will be also. What's important to you? And I can't answer that question. Only you and God can answer that question. As you look at your heart, what is it that drives you? What is it that is most important to you? And does it align with God and His Word? Because where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will be also. You know, in, in the Bible, this spot that we is translated heart kind of moved around <clears throat> sometimes they refer to it as the bowel sometimes they refer to it as the heart um, but what they're talking about is that inner part of you that part of you that makes you who you really are not the thing that everybody else sees but who you really are on the inside with all the masks stripped away that part that only you really see. That part that drives you and spurs you on. You 
You know, don't invest everything in this world. This world is an uncertain place. And, you know, the last two years have made that more clear than ever. We've come through, you know, the pandemic with COVID-19. We've come through, you know, we look in, in Europe and we see what's happening there in Ukraine. So much of this life is uncertain. You know, we could wake up tomorrow and the stock market could be, you know, way less than it is today. There's a lot of uncertainty in our world. You know, I think it's important that we focus on the main thing. And that's on Jesus. In our relationship with him. Jesus says to lay up your treasures in heaven. How do we do that? And what treasures is he talking about? Well, um, I think he's talking about people. That we should invest in people. All of the things that this world has to offer are temporary. You came into this world with nothing, and you'll leave this world with nothing. You don't really even get to leave with the clothes on your back, right? So what treasures is Jesus talking about? I think he's talking about what we invest in other people. Because the only other thing that can end up in heaven with us are loved ones that have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. It's interesting to me that when people come to the end of their lives, they are much less concerned about things <clears throat> than they are about relationships. Making sure that they are right with people <clears throat> that maybe they haven't been right with for years and years and years. The treasures that we, that we invest in heaven, that we lay up in heaven, is people that we have brought to Jesus that will get to be with us for all of eternity. And then finally, I believe that if we want to guard our heart, we need to determine to seek God with all of our heart. We need to determine to seek God with all of our heart. In Matthew 12, verses 30, or 28 through 34, Reading from the New Living Translation, it says this. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the discussion. He answered that Jesus, he realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one and the only Lord. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The teacher of religious law replied, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. So, whether this religious leader was trying to trap Jesus because it would have been very easy if Jesus said, okay, don't lie, don't steal, they could say, well, what about committing adultery? What about bearing false witness against your neighbor, right? But instead, um, Jesus said, the greatest commandment of all is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then Jesus said, I'm going to give you the bonus. I'm going to give you the second greatest commandment too. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And then Scripture goes on to say, and I know it is important, the religious leader is saying, I know it is important to love him with all my heart and with all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. Now catch this next part, right? Um, he says, this is more important 
than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required by the law. This shows that this guy understood. He understood what it was all about. In other words, what this religious leader was saying is that God desires my obedience more than he desires my repentance. In other words, God would much rather have me do the right thing the first time than to come to him and say, I'm sorry I screwed up. And isn't that true of us as well? I mean, uh, yes, if, if you know, somebody has wronged us, we want them to come and apologize, but we'd much rather that they did the right thing the first time and that the apology was unnecessary. That's what um, he's saying here. That God re- desires obedience more than he desires sacrifice. Verse 34 says, realizing this man's understanding, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Did you notice he didn't say you're in the kingdom? He said you're not far away. You see, we're commanded to love God. With all of our heart. That's job one. Is to love him with everything that is within us. And if we really love him that way. Then we're not going to take his name in vain. We're not going to worship idols. We're not going to sin. Because we truly love him with all of our heart. You, most everybody here has a special somebody in their life. Would you purposely say things to them to hurt them? I hope not. Because you love them. And you care about them. You want them to be happy. You don't want them to cry. You don't want them hurt. If we love God with all of our heart, all of the other stuff will start to fall into place. If we seek God with all of our heart, everything else will kind of fall into line. It'll fall into place. If I love God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, and all of my strength, and I love my neighbor as myself, am I going to hurt other people? No. Because I don't want to be hurt. And because I know God loves that person, I'm not going to do something that's going to hurt God. You know, we sometimes make Christianity really difficult. We want to be like the religious leaders and give them all of these rules about what they're supposed to and not supposed to do. But you know, if we really love God the way that God calls us to love him, it doesn't have to be difficult. Because we'll do the right thing in order to please him. It doesn't become a burden. It becomes becomes this opportunity to make him happy. If Vladimir Putin loved God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, and with all of his strength, 
Would he be sending tanks and troops into Ukraine? I don't think so. You see, I'm convinced that the biggest problem that our world faces today is not political. It's spiritual. And if we, if we had the Jesus thing figured out, a lot of the other problems would just go away. Because we love other people the way Jesus loves them. And we wouldn't hurt them. We would help them. Guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life.